welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, previously the madman behind Boldly Go, now dump, jumping into a distant galaxy and exploring whether or not whether or not there is anything like Rose Kell Dragon. The one and only Jeff Batone. How are you doing today, man? Oh, pretty good. Uh, doing great. Happy to be here. How are you doing? I'm doing good. It's always good when I can exp when I can expand this little crusade I've had for the last five years. Um, I had to get that reference out of my system because. Well, subject matter, and also Night Dive might be working on remastering Star Wars Dark Forces, which I've been waiting for a while because I'm sick of using DOSBox. <laughs> well, that would be nice mm -hmm. to get out of the DOSBox. Yeah, supposedly that's coming out next year, and Night Dive has a very, very, very stellar track record when it comes to remastering old PC games to, to use modern setups. Mm-hmm. Because... Trying to play really old PC games is a bit of the Wild West. <laughs> yeah, no, it can be. I, re I was, was it, ah, uh, TIE Fighter? I went back and I'm like, oh my god, you used the entire keyboard for this. Wow, I, I am not agile enough to play this game anymore. <laughs> well... It's more it's more of the technical issues cuz some games have it where the game speed is tied to the potential speed of your GPU. Oh, yes. Yes, I've had that problem too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if I go back and load up Empire Earth, all of the animations are way too damn fast. Mhm. Mm just to just mm -hmm. to use one example. Um, oh yeah. There was an ARPG called Revenant that had a similar thing where I had to go I had to go into the files and mess with, mess around with things. Mm -hmm. And that's just with the stuff that I can actually play. Then you've got then you've got stuff where the only way I can actually get it to work is by setting up a virtual machine. Oh, yeah. No, I've I've seen the people do I was it I'm a big fan of the Ultima series, and I, I think Ultima 1 through 3 is like that, where it's set on your system clock, which was great when we had, like, you know, free 286s, but I was like, I'm going to go west, and I threw myself off the side of the map, possibly into another game. Mm -hmm. So, th that's why, as, as annoying as remasters are, when it comes to remastering old stuff for modern um, systems... In, in the PC space, I'm perfectly fine with that. Yeah. Yeah, no, me too. Me mm -hmm. too. I, yeah. You know, it's always nice to see if they tweak the graphics or whatever, if they're just going to leave it as it is while making it usable on modern machines. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you can go too far when it comes to tweaking the graphics. Like, say, sure. that, that, uh, that RTX add-on for Quake 2, which just kind of smooths everything out, makes everything way too shiny. Oh yeah, I, I haven't seen it because I'm I'm the the type of gamer that who uh, who plays those first person games has to throw up after ten minutes. So yeah, those this whole genre of games that is did not mostly denied to me except in like five minute spurts. Uh, fair fair point. It's not it's not everyone's cup of tea. But with the with that said. One of the traditions around here is opening with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Okay. So I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Okay, so um, I was like 10. And my next-door neighbor, who was a few years older than me, had a friend over who was the same age as him, and they were like kind of wandering around the neighborhood looking confused, and then they saw me and they said, hey, we need somebody to play a game with us. And I'm like, I like games. What kind of game is it? And they're like, well, it's a weird kind of game. And uh, long story short, I played a first-level elf in Keep on the Borderlands for D&D. And uh, I committed a war crime. I fireballed a room full of innocent orc women and children, because that was the style at the time. 
and uh, and unfortunately, my the other player had gotten you know killed by some trap or other and started shooting free throws while I was like, I want to know what happens next. I want to go down this hallway, and I think that was the thing that really stuck for me was that it was. You know, I have this kind of hyperactive imagination, as anybody who knows me will attest. And it was like, oh, I'm engaged. I'm in that tunnel. I'm fighting those monsters. I've got these cool dice that I've never seen before. I want more of these, you know. And so I think I think it was it was like a door opening like this is the thing that I want to keep doing. And basically, that's that's how it's been ever since I've ever since that. I've, I mean, I haven't played consistently all of the years of my life since then but it is something that i am constantly returning to and thanks to covid i am now in more a zoom and discord rpg games than i have ever been in in my entire life and uh it's a little it's a little much sometimes but it's a lot of fun mm -hmm. and yeah i did i did notice a lot of people there's been two things that's gotten a lot of people jumping onto the hobby in the last few in the last few years. One of them was co was COVID. I saw a bunch more, I saw a bunch more campaigns go going about, as well as people m making stuff because well, screw it, <laughs> you're stuck in the house, you got nothing else to do but except cabin fever. Yeah, exactly. Uh, of course, the other the other thing that certainly. Um, shifted matters was it was everything that went down with with um that OGL fiasco back in January. Yeah, that was uh that was ill advised. When I did my post mortem on it, I called it a I used the word that one of their investors had used when they called when I called that company out, um, an unforced error. <laughs> yeah. That and that... I, that and I compared the, I compared the whole thing to Vince McMahon during the first incarnation of the XFL, where it was clear he had no understanding of football culture. Mm -hmm. But how? But um, the f now obviously there obviously there was the stuff before um boldly boldly go which I, which um I won't I won't go into but I want to but let's focus on boldly go first. Were okay. since since that was a since that was more was pretty much a Star Trek in R in RPG form. Did yeah. you get did you get into that through T, through TOS through TNG through Voyager? God help you if it was Voyager. I feel sorry for you. If it, <laughs> I feel sorry for you if your introduction was Voyager or even worse Enterprise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I mean. Every every Star Trek series has its own quirks, and I know that Voyager and Enterprise are not everybody's favorite, but there is stuff to love in all of it. But that being said, so I, I came about it in kind of a very backward way. I obviously I I am an old man. I grew up uh, with the original series. I caught a bunch of next gen. Uh, and some Deep Space Nine. I didn't really watch much of Voyager or Enterprise until later. Uh, really big fan of Lower Decks. Uh, but what happened is is that... Uh, and I have never, ever, ever played any of the Star Trek tabletop games that are out there. Which is probably going to be weird to some people. But basically, I was watching... I don't know if you know Red Letter Media. Oh yeah, I know. Uh, the, okay, so the Plinket reviews, and so I was watching the reviews about Star Trek, and then I started getting into their like movie reviews. I'm, you know, big fan. I've watched almost every single thing they've ever made, and uh, Mike and Rich, who are two of the guys who run Red Letter Media, super, super huge Trek nerds, like just giant Trek nerds, and hearing them talking about it, like I was like, you know, Star Trek's really cool. Yeah, I haven't seen Star Trek in a while. I'm like, you know what I want to do? I don't think I've ever watched every single episode. I've seen some. So I was like, I'm going to go back and I'm going to watch the original series in order from the beginning all the way to the end and just take it all in because I don't think I've ever done that before. So I was doing it. And like the sixth episode in, I was like, you know, somebody could make a game about this. And then I was like, S several somebody's have already made a game about this genius and i was like no but 
I have an idea. And so, and so that was the genesis of it. And it was the idea to make it because um, a lot of the Star Trek games, certainly not all of them, uh, are very focused on like very discreet, complicated numbers. Like I do this, They're I have crunchy. this amount in this science, very crunchy. The ships have all these stats. And I'm like, no, I want to do it where it's like a TV show where it's like, Kirk knows science, some, not as much as Spock, but he knows it. Uh, he could do a little doctor and maybe, not like McCoy, but he could. How does that work? What does that look like? And I just kind of went from there. Yeah, and when you, met, when, when you mentioned that kind, that kind of precision, there's a few things I'm reminded of. One, and this, this is the reason why that whole Star Trek retrospective I talked about before we went live is something I'm still not 100% about, do, about doing. Right, is, sure. Um, is I, I am very hesitant about going back and rereading um, Fossa Star Trek because it was because it was very guilty of a, of a good chunk of that. Last Unicorn a little bit less so, and of course, but there is one, but there is one adjacent project that I'm probably I'd probably spend a good amount of time poking fun at. Because of how ridiculously complicated it was, and that was Starfleet Battles. And oh yes, <laughs> to give you a bit of a refresher, I'm going to send you an image of a feder a Federation heavy cruiser sheet for Starfleet Battles. Obviously, this one's a cleaned up recreation, but you you'll get the point. Oh yeah, look at all. Oh of yes, <laughs> all the boxes. <laughs> It's like it's like you it's like they were afraid you might actually have fun with the damn game. Oh my god, yeah. Wow. Oh yeah, I remember seeing these back in the day. Oh my god. It's like I could understand that kind of thing if you were only using one ship, but Starfleet battles used well, fleets. With this level of detail. Yes. Yes, multiple ships, I think f per player. Mhm. Mm 10 hour tabletop battles probably this is the reason why whenever whenever someone tells me that a game that's come out recently is too complicated i laugh because i'm like you have no idea how easy you've got it now mm. and it's not like i'm it's not like i'm some old hat who was who was beta testing chainmail or something like that no no i'm just i just have done a lot of research yeah so sure I, so sure I, sure i know how, i so I know how how much more difficult things things were. Hell, hell, I ended up going down a, a rabbit hole once of researching the er, the early days of um, cable of cable television when mm -hmm. there was still th when there was still that battle between closed circuit and ca and cable regarding things like what would become pay per view. Uh, and j and ev even. Even just the just the earlier days of phone freaking, you know the day, the days of Captain Crunch. Mm -hmm. the, it's it's always interesting seeing how how much more complicated things can um, get. And of course, if of course if somebody wants to do the whole, it's too complicated. I will throw my copy of Hero System Sixth Edition at them. Yeah, yeah, Hero System is a lot. <laughs> For sure, the the fa the fact that the giant that the giant tome that's that's like that's over five hundred pages long is just tackling character creation. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not even get that's not even getting into the the um the um. Act the actual mechan the actual mechanics of things, like the character creation PDF PDF is four hundred and sixty six pages. So I'm, it's not five hundred like I thought it was, but it's damn close. Yeah, yeah, you could easily round up, and no one would no one would fault you for that. Mm -hmm. But now with the now I'm guessing because you built it around the TV show, that's the reason why you built things around traits and a distant galaxy is more or less using the same system if i'm not mistaken 
Uh, yeah, you're correct. It's, uh, it is the same with a few tweaks and a few add-ons. Um, and it, so origi originally it was more, it was more numbers based, uh, where it was like, oh, you've got science of three and you've got this and that, da, 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 da. and I play tested that a few times and I'm like, I don't, I don't really like this. <laughs> like this isn't doing what I want to do. And I remember I had played a game where we had used traits system. Uh, somebody was like, oh, was it? it was Marvel superhero, but he had added this extra thing where it was like traits. And I was playing this basically a monster mutant. And I had the trait wants to be human. And he said, this is a, this is a negative trait. This is going to hurt you. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a problem. And so I was like, all right. So I went through the whole game saddled with that. I get to the end and the bad guy is also a monster. And I was like, wait, I'm going to try talking him down. And if you will allow me, I want to do a cool thing. I think I want to use my wants to be human trait uh, instead of as a negative, as a bonus to my role, because I understand exactly how this guy feels and yada da 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 and it worked out and that was something that i had in my back pocket for years and years and years and i was like oh my god actually that's perfect and the example that i always use when i'm ex describing the trade system and how it works and how it activates is that scene that you often get where bones is like my god there's a plague on the planet we've gotta we gotta do something and spock raises an eyebrow and says well logically doctor we can't save them all because he's a logical guy that's his trait and mccoy says no god damn it you cold-blooded vulcan freak we've gotta save everyone because he's the doctor and that's his trait and that's you know that's like you compare you contrast and that's where the role-playing comes from and it limits you in some ways and it gives you surprising advantages in other ways and and uh, that's when I junked the previous system and plugged that in and the whole thing just started going. So, yeah, it was really a way to, I, I, I mean, all role-playing games can have as much or as little role-playing as you want. But I wanted, I wanted a, a way to make it take more center stage and feel like you were in an episode of the show. So that's where I was going with it. And ideally it works. We'll see. <laughs> now... That bring that brings me to the the um, core mechanic, which yeah, <clears throat> in your case is a D, is a D six based um, system. Mm -hmm. Now, as I understand as I understand it, and you can and you can help me fill in the blanks as I get, as we go. Um, you you have one die for each tra for each trait, um, right? There are situational modifiers, but I'm ignoring that for the time being because that's um that's too many moving parts. Sure, sure. And every every five or six counts as it counts as a hit. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's written as successes, but old habits die hard. Sure. And if you meet a tar if you meet a target number, then you pet then you pass. That's right. Yeah. No. Uh, and for and for doing something against the static difficulty, usually you need at least two of those, two hits, two successes. Mm -hmm. And if you are rolling against somebody who has their who is acting against you, you have to get more successes than they do. Mm -hmm. And that's that's basically uh, that's the core mechanic. Uh, like you said, there's modifiers depending on the situation. Uh, there's also uh, you can gain drama points and one of the things that i i like about the system that i hit on pretty early is that one of the ways that you gain drama points is is by failing so even if you don't get this roll you might get the next one or the one after that and uh so you sort of you it's like again it's like the show where it's like in the first half hour we don't know what the problem is we're we're not sure how to deal with it we're trying things that don't work and then in the second half hour, because we've built up all of our drama points, everything starts exceeding, and and we end on a high note. And uh, and you also, when you spend drama points, they become experience points that you use to improve your character between episodes. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's that's basically it. It's uh, it's pretty simple. People usually get it right away, and 
Uh, a lot of people seem to like it, even though some people are like, this is, it's hard, you're only going to get a 33% chance to get a success at a time. Like, I know. Work together. Get more dice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I think that brings that brings up an interesting thing where a lot of folks, I, and I, there's, cer there's certain games that have certainly contributed to this of of people building the um, character or, or the like with the idea of building up a powerful character instead yeah. of being instead of being part of a bigger whole. There are mm -hmm. some more recent games that have attempted to address this, but it is it is going to be a long, slow process, which I'm very much I'm very much aware of. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I do like the fact that tra that traits are a case of you've either got it or you don't because. Mm -hmm. Something that can happen with skill points is you can end up with a sunk cost issue. Because look, look at the let's look let's look at the cast. Just whether whether we want to use the cast of um t of TOS or or the or the cast of um original trilogy Star Wars. Sure. They all the majority of the majority of characters have a wide variety of skills that they that they can call upon but it's not like there's a defined area of skill of skills that they have which is why trying to adapt them in games that build those kind of things they end up having a boatload of sk of skills and yeah with with the whole sk with the way a lot of games utilize skill points for one there's the issue of how do you how do you differentiate between um, three points in computing versus four points, narratively speaking. Mm -hmm. But also, once you've started that investment, the there you're a bit disincentivized to learn new skills because those skills have to play catch up. Yeah, no, that's that's true. That's true. And then you get the games where, I mean, D and D five E is obviously the go to where it's like, well. I picked this class, and this class gives me these abilities, and the more I get in this class, the more I get in these abilities. And and so it's like, so I so either I can't change lanes, or like you said, I am incentivized not to change lanes, uh, because then I'm a weaker version of something that somebody already is, and how useful is that, and blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. And the, I mean, you. I mean, in that kind of situation, you could multi-class, but that provides its sure. own problems. <laughs> right. Right. And the only t the only time D and D has ever done multi-classing in a in a way that didn't drive me insane, well, more insane. Let me clarify. <laughs> was <laughs> the addition that everybody tells me I'm supposed to hate, but I don't because the checks didn't clear. That being that being fourth edition, I uh, yeah no no fourth edition, uh, as much flack as it gets, had a lot of interesting things going for it, and that was one of them. Yeah, I've I've ta I've tackled some of the flack that people that people give, especially the whole oh, the, especially the whole two MMO like, which always seems to come from people who have no idea how MMO design works because they never answer <laughs> me when I say, okay, is it is it sandbox or theme park? Right, uh, and I th and because of the fact that things are built on traits, you end up in something like a distant galaxy. Um, you end up you end up addressing and solving one other problem. Oh hey, and and um, this is ju this is just something I've I've noticed just from just from my own experiences. So I don't mean to I don't mean to get off on on a bit on a bit of a tangent, but believe me, there I am going somewhere with this. Now, okay. You All right. Have, I'll follow you wherever you're going. You have the source, which I do have the source for all intents and purposes is the is the is not far removed from channeling and using the force in in Star Wars. You even have your own disciplines for it. Yeah, absolutely. Now, in did you ever play Star Wars Galaxies? Ah. Uh... Which one was Star Wars Galaxies? That was the first MMO attempt. 
I read about it, but I did not play it. No, I played the Old Republic, and that was it. So, with and it, and actually, the Old Republic pr provides a good thing because it, because you have to spend a good amount of time in the in the first one before you even start getting Jedi stuff. Yeah, but with Star Wars Galaxies, that was a sandbox style where a lot of the fun came was very player was very player generated when it came to the various roles. Um, mm -hmm. Eve Online has a has a similar attitude. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And its lead designer Ralph Coster was adamant about not putting Jedi in the game. That I remember. I remember and it was a big deal that there were no Jedi starting out. The reason for that, according to him, was Jedi would become an alpha class. Where mm -hmm. everybody would try, er, because of the cool factor that the movies produced when it came to Jedi, everybody would try and chase that. And he felt that if everybody's chasing that, they're not doing any of the other jobs, and the whole thing's gonna tumble in on itself. Mm -hmm. When he was forced to put it in, he was like, "All right, I'll make. All right, you can do it, but you gotta earn it because you have to be force sensitive, which is a die roll, and you have to find holocrons, which." Eventually, people started mapping out where the spawn locations for holocrons were, so that lot of good that did. Right. And then NGE happened, where they made it where you could just be a Jedi right out of the gate, and that was a contributing factor to the game getting killed. Now, bringing this to this to the source in um in what I'm seeing with the distant galaxy, because of the fact that Ever, that everything ties into traits. That idea of having to be dedicated in the in the same sense to to treating the Jedi thing as as a sole focus is not present or possible. Uh, no, not really. Not written. Although, give, although given the way um, given the way a lot of it works, I am. One thing I am curious about is how is how someone could utilize the trait system to do the equivalent of the lightsaber combat styles. Okay. Uh so so I I will definitely tell you that uh if you're talking about like form 1 or form 3 or whatever, yeah. I don't know that a distant galaxy is that granular uh to do that um uh but you can you can use the source and your traits to make yourself fight better uh and do cool gymnastics stuff uh which is i, I which i guess is more like the, the pure movie experience before they codified like this is Vapod and this is whatever the other ones are. That Vapod's the only one I remember for some reason. Uh, Mace Windu, I guess. Um, but yeah, like there, there is there is a way to. And I mean, the thing about the 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 trait system, just sort of backfilling a little bit here, so that people kind of understand where I'm coming from with it, is that you get these traits and. They say certain things like you're logical or you're honorable or you're athletic or whatever. And if you can get them to fit what you're trying to do and how you're trying to do it, then you get it as a die. So if you are, you know, honorable and cautious when you fight, uh, you know, that a determines what, what it looks like when you, when you swing a, a sun blade around which is the generic equivalent in a distant galaxy. Uh, and also, if you do that, then you will get those dice, which will make you stronger as a fighter than if you were just like, I flail away like a maniac, and I don't have any traits that say I can do it. So, um, but yeah, it's all, it's a lot of like trying to wed the narrative to what the mechanics can do, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that makes sense. Makes sense, and the the big reason I like I like to focus on the on the lightsaber forms it's it's a very good way of demonstrating a lesson that I try and te I try and teach people, and that is to put more thought into how someone is um, does their particular style of combat. Sure. Because okay, 
You look at Ma Makashi, for example, which Count Dooku used, is pretty much a fencing style. Mm -hmm. It, you know, a lot, a lot of economy of motion, a lot of parry, a lot of riposte, that sort of thing. Um, Ataru is heavily is heavily drawing upon wushu, and that's where you have a lot of acrobatics. Right, and the. And then, then with Vapod, with Vapod, it is this kind of controlled is this kind of controlled chaos that is more about drawing up instead of drawing upon one's own emotions, drawing upon the enemies. Right, right. And I've maybe it's be, maybe it's because of my background with like fighting ga with like fighting games, but I've always tried to tell to tell people fighting a bait. Don't th don't think of basic attack. That's that's a don't use the one size fits all approach. That's how you get Babby's first character as a martial character. And because of the wide variety of potential things that traits can be, uh, within the book, do you pl do you plan on putting in advice for? What for um the for what makes a good or a or a bad trait when people are putting in their own? Uh, yes and no. Uh, so, uh, it, so I have to actually then explain what a good and a bad trait is in the system. So traits I describe are mostly positive yeah. or mostly negative, and a mostly positive trait means that it is kind of obviously quote unquote. Um, something that will help you. So like if you're strong or if you're fast or if you're smart or if you pay attention, um, it's like, oh, okay, it's easy to see how I can use this to help myself. And so you call upon it, you get dice, you roll. Uh, some traits are negative traits. So you're like suspicious or you're stubborn or whatever. And what happens then is that when you, when you go into a challenge where you roll dice, you say, okay. And the example I always give is you and your buddy... You get captured, you're put in the cell. He says to you, all right, here's the deal. I'm going to pretend I got the stomach problem. You're going to go call the guard. You're going to tell him I'm sick. When they open the door, we're going to jump him. And you're like, dude, got it. Okay, solid. You run over to the door. And as you start talking, you realize my character has the honesty trait. So I am I am a bad liar. So I say, well, I'm doing all of this, da-da-da-da-da, but I'm honest. And that makes the challenge a little bit harder, but also gives you more drama points that you can spend later. Mm -hmm. And then you roll and you see what happens. But it's not like it's not like one side of the fence or the other. Like if you are trying to get a suspicious person, a suspicious person to, to trust you to talk to you, you say, "Well, I'm honest," <laughs> and if they realize that I'm honest, they're more likely to trust me. I get a die kind of a thing and so there's there's a discussion of like you know here's here's kind of some examples and here's the gray line in between and people have said to me you know at the table like do i have to take negative traits and i said no you don't but there may be a time when the trait that you think is a good thing is a bad thing and vice versa and there's mechanical uses for both that can you know, one's longer around the side than the other, but there's there's ways that they can always benefit you in some way. Mm -hmm. And and once people really embrace that, they're like, okay. I like I had one guy, we were playing a game and he said, what was it? It was uh he has poor boundaries. So it's like, well there's this this room that you have to get into and he's like, I kick in the door because I don't have any boundaries. I'm like, all right, add that tie to your pool. And it's like, mm -hmm. oh, Oh, being a jerk is paying off. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I also note that I like that you have um, money abstracted. I will always appreciate that with within systems. Oh, good, good. Because uh, when you when you're dealing with when you're dealing with a a game where you're going to be going through a bunch of different planets with a bunch of different tech levels, trying to utilize a universal um, currency can. Be, can be a bit tricky, yeah. Especially, especially given the um, TV show or or film like approach that you're going with this system, mm -hmm. which is which I'd imagine is the reason why you have you kind of have a um, 
a rule of 12 when it comes to how um, item acquisition works? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, I mean, part, part of it is that, like... Uh, I mean, buying things has never been my favorite part of gaming <laughs> going going shopping and buy i mean sometimes it's fine but most of the time it's just like yeah you've got new armor i don't care how much it costs you just have it it's fine um and i lucked out because boldly go is my first game and that one is the post-scarcity economy where there's no money or whatever so it's like you've got a uniform and a ray gun and a computer cater and go to town like stuff is not important in that game really and then I got to this, which is set in like a more capitalistic kind of, I mean, depending on the planet, but usually it's like, you need money to buy the parts for your engine, and if you don't have the money, then you've got to have a slave kid race for you, so you can get the part, da 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 um, But I just, I wanted to do it more abstract, because I'm like, I don't, because the other way that I was doing it, and somebody was like, you don't have to do it this way if you don't want to, was the whole, like, well, how much is a credit worth? And what if you're on a planet where the economy sucks? And what if you have to barter? And I was like, nope, nope, nope. Just throw it all out. You know, you start with some stuff. You could buy other stuff, maybe. It depends. Who cares? <laughs> yeah, which, it, which is, is certainly a certainly a more efficient approach because um you go too far down that rabbit hole and th and then you're starting to debate about how about how you're going to handle um in universe economy and it becomes a cry for help yeah yeah and i am not an economist and it would not look realistic anyway so it's just like ah, no no i have better things to do with my time than this also if you're if you're wanting realism why pl why are you playing a game like this right that's also fair Maybe you'd be better served with some with something like Star Citizen. Oh, okay, God. that's a bit, okay. That's a bit harsh, but you get the sure. point. Yes, yes. But now, one of the things I I'd also I'd also note I'd also um, made note of since is the is the fact that you are you are utilizing a a fair a fairly straightforward wound system mm -hmm. um you know what and it's, it's one where it's more it's more or less shared there's not going to be a um species that's going that's all of a sudden, that's going to be able to take more hits because we're dealing with um bl we're dealing with blaster we're dealing with blasters we're dealing with sun swords and we're dealing with we're dealing with things that are going to very easily put you in the dirt if you're not prepared right And now to that to that end, when it comes to it, when it comes to ships, mm -hmm. uh, I mean we this wouldn't be a space opera if we didn't have ships. No, um, I did see that in that in both boldly go and with this, it is doing it. You have a um, you have a vehicle sheet. You have a vehicle sheet specifically. That's meant to represent the whole group, right? So, would it be fair of me to say that you are operating under the idea that the ship is as much of a character as well the characters? I I would definitely say so. Yeah, and that was something. I mean, that was something that I got from watching Star Trek, which is that like, because initially you showed me this uh, Starfleet Battles thing, and initially I was like. How do I how I do ship? Like, do I do the ship like this, where it's like you've got all these systems and this, that, and the other thing? And a friend of mine uh was like, That's not that's not what the show is about. The show isn't about these numbers and levels. The show is this is a set. It can do whatever it needs to. It takes damage based on drama. And so I try to with with the Boldly Go game, uh basically abstract it out. Uh, and so it is basically just a pile of traits that the players can can draw upon. So it's like if you have like a really good Xeno linguistics library, then whenever that comes up, you use it as a trait if you've got access to the ship. Mm -hmm. And what I found was when I said to the players, okay, the very first thing you're going to do 
before you do anything, before you make characters, anything else is, you're going to tell me and one another what kind of a ship you want to have and you're going to pick traits for that ship and so you're going to say like i've gotten everything from this is the the alliance's garbage scow and we're like the most embarrassing ship in the fleet but we're still in the fleet too we have this experimental giant cannon on board and most of our ship is taken up by it and we don't know why we have it and and that basically like you said the ship becomes a character What's the deal with this? How does it work? How do we use it to solve our problems? How can we use its traits to traits to best supplement ourselves and get what we need to do done? And I found that it was a great way actually to pull everybody together because you start out and you say, okay, you're on the bridge. Who are you? I don't know. Okay, you're on the bridge of this giant ship that, that turns out to be a huge gun. Uh, I guess I'm the science officer and I'm researching why we have this thing. And it's like, great, that's plot. <laughs> you know? And, and so in a, in, um, in a distant galaxy, I do kind of the same thing where everybody starts out with a personal vehicle. That's very generic. It's like, you have this ship and it's kind of crappy and whatever. Don't worry about it. Or you can say, well, I'm going to give up my ship so that I can give another player's ship some benefit like make it bigger make it hold more cargo or more guns or better shields or interesting stuff and so like one of the games i ran into con had nine players and there was there was like okay we're cashing in all of our chips and making this giant ship that's actually reasonably okay and it's got all these mods and stuff on it and they're talking about like yeah and if you go to my quarters this that and the other thing and then one person's like i don't i don't want to do that I'm going to keep my ship, my own personal little rinky dinky ship. And it's a speeder bike. And I put it in the hold and that's mine. And none of y'all can touch it. And they were like, cool. <laughs> there's, there's a few shows I can think of when it comes to this whole ship as character thing that, that mm -hmm. provide a good of a bit of frame of reference. Um, one of them is, and what I'd say all three of the ones I have in mind are going to be pretty obvious. One of them is, yeah. is of course, um, Firefly. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, every every time, every time you ha the fi the Serenity itself, a Firefly class ship, every time mm -hmm. it's seen, it's, people are like, they, "Wait, they still make those?" Like it's right. It's viewed as this re this rinky dink relic, right? Um, uh, and of course, on the anime end of things, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up both Cowboy Bebop and Outlaw Star. Oh yeah, for sure, definitely. Yeah, I mean, with Cowboy Bebop, the Bebop itself is a is a fishing ship, um, mm -hmm. and Sp Spike, Jet, and Faye each have their own per each have their own personal ships. Whether it be Spike with the Swordfish Two, Faye with the or Faye with the Red Tail, which does which does not believe in the concept of friendly fire, just fire. <laughs> <laughs> right. And of course, without Lost Star, you have a whole, you have a whole lot of plot because of all the mysteries that the um, Outlaw Star itself has as a ship, mm -hmm. uh, as well as some of the bigger mysteries when it can when it comes to that story. But that's me getting ahead ahead of myself. And I'd I'd say one of the bigger thing one of the bigger things that's always been appealing when it comes to something like Star Wars or just a lot of space operas and space westerns is the be is the best of the worst coming together. Oh you know, yeah. Pe people who have a bunch of different backgrounds who have varying degrees of morality and varying degrees of really 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 bad luck. Yes. Yes, 100%. Yeah, and and that's I mean, and and the great thing because that's that's a great thing to play. It's like, yeah, we're losers, but uh, but we're still here. Let's see what we can do. Yeah, um, a long time when the film Inglorious Bastards came out, I used that as a basis for a spy fiction campaign, where it's, where it was like, you <laughs> you guys are you guys are a member of an elite espionage group that is that does its best to keep the city that to keep the world safe from terror from terrorists. Mm -hmm. 
Those are the people up top. You're not them. <laughs> you are the right. outcasts. You are the yeah. you are the misfits. The guys who, for whatever reason, are good are good at your job, but you ha- but there are certain um, traits that are that ma- that deem you labeled as troublemakers. Um, right. I'd also since a, since a few people there were shooter fans, I'd also referenced um, Battlefield Bad Company because it kind of has the same vibe. They're mm-hmm. they're meant to be yeah. the, in that with that crew. They're meant to be the expendable guys in front in front of the advanced special forces. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. When the special forces is too valuable to send on something, they send you guys. Right. Yeah. Just soak up the bullets for us, boys. You're doing great. <laughs> yeah. And there was also the trailer for for the project called Overstrike that served as in- inspiration which had that whole thing of the misfits. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the it's it describes one of the characters in in that teaser as oh he's 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 calm and collected, almost like a Buddhist monk. Then it cuts to the actual footage of how he operates and he's go- and he's full berserk. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. But I th- it's because of the fact that th- that that's not far removed. That's a little bit easier to connect than say you're playing at you're playing as the um, top tier nobleman, right? Not that you can't. Not that you can't. I mean, one of the sa- from what I'm seeing, one of the sample characters is a, is a noble. Just what? Just um, one one with his own little problems. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's the Solar Empire. They it's an empire, so there's nobility. Mm-hmm. Um, the the uh, assumption is that you are one of the lesser nobles that doesn't really account for much. But you can still throw your weight around uh, until you get shot, mm-hmm. and <laughs> and then it's a problem. I mean, I've I've always I've I've done I've done my fair share of characters that are more of the that are more the white collar crime. The last, the last one I did in these kind of games was his whole thing was being the was being the um the one of the world's biggest con men. Aha! Uh-huh. Yes. But not the the kind of the kind of person who who is able to who is able to charm some, somebody into doing what they want, or in, mm-hmm. in some cases, um, he's not gonna, he's not going to stick up and rob you. He's going to talk. He's going to talk you into. To, into you giving your wallet to him with a smile. Right, right. He's going to make you think it was your idea. Yeah. Of course, because because of that, it created the drama of any time he had an idea, everybody looks at him side-eyes because they don't know <laughs> if he's being legit or if he's trying to pull something. Right. Exactly. Which... Yeah, yeah. Because I... And obviously, those kind of things are are building on what came before because everybody likes a good heist story. Mm-hmm. And I know I know some will argue solo, but as as far as I'm concerned, we haven't had a true um, Ocean's Eleven style he- style heist story in a in um in Star Wars or anything or anything like that. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Like, there's been, there's definitely been aspects of, of that kind of a story in a bunch of stuff in Star Wars, but never like the, this is how we're gonna bust in and get the stuff, you know, kind of thing. Which is too bad because that's, I mean, with the kind of characters you get, it really lends itself to that if you really wanted to do that. Yeah, and I've, uh, and obviously, when I say Ocean's Eleven, I'm referring to the remake that we got that we got into the early 2000s, not the original Rat Pack. Mm-hmm. But given given that you have the um the the Empire, would it be f- the vibe that I'm getting is that you is that you're not trying to do the Empire versus Republic thing. The Empire is just the is just a major power within the galaxy. Yeah, yeah. So um, there was a couple of things that I was because I'm like I want to do Star Wars, but I don't want to do that one story because I think there's a lot more stories that you can do. And I was like, let I'm gonna have that be 
official Star Wars, you know. And I'm like, so there's an empire, and it's not good, and it's not bad. It's just a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I drew a lot of inspiration from, like, Dune and Foundation and mm-hmm. stuff like that, where it's not like, you know, there's the evil emperor. There's not the black and white morality necessarily. Um, it's just this is this is the thing that kind of governs the galaxy, and it's fallen apart. And, uh, you, you know, that's the backdrop for you to make your own way in the universe. And you can certainly interact with the, I guess, the core worlds of the Empire and do stuff like that. But my idea is that it's sort of set on the fringes where, like, you know, desperate people live doing desperate things, trying to make a buck and stay alive. So it's a lot more, I guess... Maybe, maybe like Mando inspired kind of, where it's you know the the not super gritty because I'm not a super gritty person, but the gritty space western more than the the Titanic battle of of good versus evil. Yeah, I can, I can get behind. I can certainly get behind that. Now, cool. with the, with that in mind, oh, obviously. Obviously, there's a lot of things that can happen in space, and from wh- from what I understand, you do plan on ha- putting in a generator of sorts that is going to that is going to handle um, ph- different phenomena. Uh, I mean, only only in regards to like plots for adventures. Yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of what I meant. Essentially, a sto- a story seed. Um, yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. Yeah, there is a there is a story, you know, if you if you come up with a cool story on your own, that's totally fine and we don't mind and we I mean me, but um yeah, there's a way that you can roll like here's an interesting thing that's happening and here's where it's happening and here's some of the people that are involved and you can use that as a springboard to create an adventure or you can look at it, and I do this too where I roll it and I'm like, eh, that doesn't make any sense, but I like these two things. What can I do with these two things, you know?" Mhm. And I know that's not for everybody because not everybody can just take stuff and easily like spit it into a whole story. Uh, but for the people who uh, who can, it's there. And for the people who have more trouble with that, I'm trying to write adventures. <laughs> so, so hopefully there'll be a little bit for everyone. And one of the things that I try to do is I try to make it as a genre appropriate as possible like uh if you've because i it sounds like you've read it yeah. the uh boldly go uh, episode generator mm-hmm. all of the plot points are from different original series episodes so if you roll on that you're going to start to see stuff that looks a lot like you know hey that's like space seed hey that's like devil in the dark that's that's cool and that's why <laughs> That's that certainly makes sense, and yeah, there, there's 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 plenty of, there's plenty of um, things th- things through the TV sh- through the TV shows and the like. There's there is such there is such a wealth of mater- of material that already is there is there yeah. that um it wouldn't take too much effort to t- to take that kind of thing and adapt it into whatever you have planned. Right, exactly. Oh, I know that there's a few YouTube ch- channels that have been have been going through t- have been going through episodes of Star Trek and saying this is what you could take from for your campaign. Mm-hmm. Um, I almost want to challenge one of them to tr- to try and do that with the bad episodes of t- of TNG, like Code <laughs> of Honor. Like, okay, oh. here's here's the worst episode of of early TNG. What can you take from this? Yeah, how 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 are we going to do this? Mm-hmm. And of, yeah. co- of course I'm pr- I'm pretty sure some people will try after cursing me out for about 5 minutes for suggesting it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's it's cer- it's certainly a po- it's certainly in the realm of possibility. Oh yeah, for sure. Oh. Uh, I also couldn't help but, but notice when it came to the adventure generator the um, four segments of people, plot, things, and places. 
Yeah. When you're writing, when you're writing adventures proper, because I had I hadn't looked at the at the adv- at the adventure PDF um, from from to boldly go. I just had the I just have the core book. Uh-huh. Uh Sure. Is it? Do you use that as your basis for how you build adventures? Those uh, four elements. Sometimes, yes. Uh, so, um, for Boldly Go, I, I published something called the Coronavirus Adventures, which were what it sounds like adventures that I ran during lockdown. Mm-hmm. And some of them were like, I, I thunk up this plot whole cloth. Like, this is something that I want to do. But for most of them, uh, they were like, people were like, can you run us through a Boldly Go game? That would be cool. We're bored. And I'm like, okay, yeah, let me roll something. And so, in the front of each uh, episode guide, I have these are Jeff's roles on those charts in the back of the book. So you can see, like, this is what I got, and the adventure is, this was my thought process is making these up. And obviously, the adventures that I ran are probably, they're mostly similar, but they're a little different because, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, and I got to sense the sense of, you know, how do I refine this? How do I you know, tweak this thing that I did that I didn't think worked a hundred percent the first go around, but yeah, you can, you can totally see like, this is what I did. This is what I rolled. Uh, so yeah, I, I am, but a mortal man like you, and this is how I make adventures. Mm -hmm. Um, which I think is, is good because it sort of, it sort of in a way shows like from these four things that I rolled, I created this, uh, you know, four, eight, you know, 12 hour adventure session and it Mm. works okay. But I think it helps, you know, with, with properties like star Wars and star Trek, because there's already, you can already draw from the zeitgeist. There's so many stories and so many plots and you can look at something and say, that's star Trek story. And that was what really helped me make the generators. So you sit down and you're like, okay, the reason I feel like I'm in a star Trek or star Wars story when I'm playing this is because Jeff called it from watching rebels or watching enterprise or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I can, I will certainly look forward to how that, how that goes down. Now, what are you shooting for as far as a page count in total? Uh, so, uh, let's see about that. That's a good question. I think we're looking for a distant galaxy. It's going to be, um, I think it's, uh, 80, 80 to 90 pages, something like that. And that's everything. Uh, it's, it's the full rules. It's a little bit of the background. Not obviously not nothing comprehensive, but enough to give you a sense for like what's going on in there. Um, uh, it's all the character creation rules, all the equipment rules, all the rules for ships. Um, there is an NPC section which tells you how to make your own. Um, there's quick rules for NPCs rolling if you're if you don't want to fiddle around with giving each and every NPC you have traits because that takes a lot of time. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a sample adventure called a quick delivery where it starts out you are. You are on a space station, and you are out of gas. And you are like, I guess we'll have to get a real job now. And then somebody says, actually, if you could just deliver this package for me, I will totally pay for fuel for you. And you're like, okay, that sounds cool. And then, adventure! And there's also the um, uh, the uh, the thing we talked about, the random uh, adventure generator. Uh, there's uh, a phoneme generator. If you if you have like me, sometimes have trouble coming up with names of things, you can roll on the chart until you get something that sounds like a word. So basically, everything you need to play, including a sample ship uh, and uh, ten sample characters, uh, complete characters, complete ship. You don't have to roll anything. You don't have to really read too much. You're just like, I pick this one. I pick the crabby robot, and we're going. Mm-hmm. There is and one. At, there is one. Sh- there is one series I think could um provide pl- could provide plenty of inspiration that might be a bit unorthodox to some. Okay. Red Dwarf. Oh yeah! Oh god, I love Red Dwarf. Yeah. You mentioned for Krabby sure. Android, and that's the first thing that came to mind. Yes. 
Yes, no, you could definitely roll up some pretty good Red Dwarf characters with this if you wanted to. That's for sure. Just don't put ketchup on lobster. No, no, God, no. <laughs> That's great. That's good stuff. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, definitely Red Dwarf. Mm -hmm. And I have a weird enough sense of humor that that would totally work. Oh, it would. It wouldn't be the first. It wouldn't be the first time that I've referenced that since when I had the guy behind Weird Space on, which has the subtitle of Sci-Fi Bollocks. So you can <laughs> you can kind of figure out what he was drawing from. Yeah, that's yeah, that's definitely an homage right there for mm -hmm. sure. And I've gone on record as as saying one of my fa one of my favorite characters in science fiction is Cat. Oh, he's so good. Even if even Danny if John Jules is great. Even if he takes whining to an art form. He does. I think especially because. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Solid show. Mm -hmm. Very fun. But I will I, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how a distant how um things shake out with a distant galaxy. Um if, and if um if no if nobody else beats me to it when it comes to the when it comes to the lightsaber forms I'll just do it myself because okay it's not it's not like I haven't done that already with trying to put a bunch of wuxia stuff into 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 other tabletop games yeah that sounds awesome I would love to see it if you come up with something yeah but with that said I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. Oh, and it's my pleasure. Anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then... On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!